Good morning, Revolution. Hello. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning Revolution. Revolution. Good morning, Revolution. You guys are always late. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, big week this week. It's always a big week. Keep saying that. Uh, Hurricane Ida swept across Louisiana. And then, I don't know why hurricanes always go uh, east. Why don't they go out to California, Rosanna? I mean, not that I'm wishing any of you guys. Too many feel, mountains but... to too many mountains protect us. Yeah, you guys don't get the typhoons either, do you? From Asia? No, <laughs> no, we don't. Uh, <clears throat> we got well, the fallout got... from Japan doing the Fuji. What's this called? Fujihima, the the nuclear mm. plant. We did. We yes, did that. Yes. Yeah. Terrible. Well, you got enough problems with forest fires and uh, yeah. earthquakes. So mm -hmm. that's, <laughs> yeah. that's more than enough that Mother Nature has visited upon the good <laughs> right. people of uh, uh, California. But it was a terrible storm in New York, Michael. Terrible. It sure was. Yeah. 11 that... people died, drowned in their basements. Can you mm -hmm. imagine? And uh, even our building, you know, the basement got flooded what about you you have any problems michael you know i live on the fourth floor so I, I knew i wasn't gonna like wake up and have to put my flutter pants on but um the subways all the subway stations in manhattan were flooded um and were closed temporarily i know a lot of trains weren't coming in from you know brooklyn and queens and so forth those tend to be above ground but in manhattan it's all underground and so it's it just shows you you know, the, what global warming and climate change is doing to us, you know, who would have thought that a hurricane, and those of you who don't live in the United States don't know geography, coming through the Gulf of Mexico and hitting Louisiana, then coming mm -hmm. up to the Northeast to New York and still being that strong to flood all of Manhattan, something's going on. This wasn't normal. And a tornado touched down in the Bronx, mm -hmm. not Kansas, not Oklahoma, not Texas, that was the Bronx. So it was, you know, it's blowing people's mind. And people are, oh, this has never happened. Well, you're right, it's never happened because you know we're living in a different time and we have a very short amount of time to fix this problem uh, before we're really in trouble. And I'm scared of tornadoes. One time me and my brother went fishing and a tornado had just struck, I don't know, a couple of hours before. And I was so frightened, I said, no, nah, let's get out of here. And they were like, Joey, come on, man, you're being ridiculous. It don't strike twice in the same place. But uh, that, I didn't pay that any mind. Mm -hmm. No, it's very, very, very dangerous. And the EPA just uh, issued a report, first ever of its kind, which is really no surprise. It said climate change is going to hurt people of color disproportionately. Uh, Native Americans and uh, people living in Alaska, the Eskimo people will suffer more from both uh, flood and drought. And uh, Latinos, of course, from drought because living in the South and the Southwest and West, and uh, African Americans as well. So, but there's no surprise there because of our circumstances of life and where we live and toxic waste dumps and so on and so forth that the environmental racism impacts us disproportionately, as did COVID. But one good piece of the news about COVID, Anita, is that finally people in the South are getting vaccinated. The rates of vaccination are going up because the infection rates are increasing. Mm -hmm. so, I, have, I have seen them out, that about Florida. But I just want to add something about uh, that climate change thing. They said the, the strength of that. I mean, it seemed to me in the past they would say, oh, no one event can be you know, laid at the feet of climate change alone. But they're saying that about this one because um, it had that rapid increase because the Gulf, uh, the Gulf of Mexico was so warm, so it really rapidly increased, and that that meant people couldn't evacuate fast enough uh, from New Orleans, and it meant that strength of that hurricane went all the way to New York. It's really, it's really scary. I think, I mean, Hurricane Sandy, I think, really hit New York, New Jersey, very hard, but um, but this one is just seems indisputably uh, linked to climate change. Yes, I came back the day after Hurricane Sandy and I ended up hurting my foot and I had to go to the emergency room. I had to go to three emergency rooms, all of them were full, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, full, full, because 
some of the hospitals had to shut down. Bellevue mm -hmm. was shut, NYU was shut. And, uh, you know, and then he went, I went down to one on 2nd Avenue and 14th, Mount Sinai, and there was hundreds of people. You'd have to wait two days to be mm -hmm. seen. It was, it was a mess. And you can imagine how it is now with COVID too. So well, that, that's the that's the weird thing. You're talking about how warm the water is, and even just last week we had Hurricane. I say Henry, but they were calling Henri on the on the news. <laughs> and the water. I mean, I went to the beach a few weeks ago um, off, off Long Island, and it's freezing cold still. You know, it's the Northern Atlantic. It's freezing cold. So the fact that these tropical storms are coming up here, you know, and the water that's as cold as you know Titanic whatever it's just it kind of blows your mind you're thinking we're living in a different time you know living in a in the 21st and, and and you know by the way i was just studying about the u.s policy towards china yesterday and there's been a big shift which we really have to look into with respect to the biden administration uh policy towards china in some ways it's more strident than trump's and, uh, and uh, for example, they're saying that one of the members of the National Security Council said that the uh, era of engagement is over. Peaceful coexistence is over. They're in for confrontation. And 40 organizations, along with Bernie Sanders, uh, separately uh, sent a letter to the Biden ad administration saying, you got to come off of this policy because if only for the reason of climate change, the United States has to cooperate with China to reduce global emissions. It's extremely dangerous. The survival of the planet is at stake, Rosanna. And that, uh, therefore, you can't be going down this crazy road of confrontation. But we, well, I think deep, you know, a deeper look into it is that the Afghanistan, Afghanistan war is over. So how is the military industrial complex going to make its profits? They have to find some other enemy that, you know, that they can make more money out of. I mean, it's just ridiculous. So it's, it's constant the, you know, capitalism always has to find an enemy to keep that war machine going and, you know, the profits going and just all of those kinds of things. And so I think that we really have to call for a cut in the military budget. We really have to take a deeper look as American citizens and as Americans uh, take a deeper look as to what is, what the, the, the actual cost of the Afghan war was, not just to, uh, to us, but to the uh, Afghan people. And the fact that, you know, we're not taking care of our business here at home. There are children who are going hungry. There are people on the streets, living in the streets. It's just, you know, how can we go and say that we're going to go fix someone else's country when we have our own country to fix here, first and foremost? And so that money needs to be spent here, first and foremost, instead of going out somewhere else. And China is not our enemy. And no one is our enemy until we make them our enemy, you know. And then and when we get aggressive that way, people have to defend themselves. So we can't, we can't allow ourselves to be fooled into another war. We just can't. We have to really learn the lessons of this, of this past war. Very true. And Anita, I was reading an article the other day on political, I think, and they, they, it was about the hidden message in Biden's speech on uh, Afghanistan and the withdrawal, which he defended vigorously. <laughs> You know, uh, he said it was an excellent withdrawal and uh, mm -hmm. praised uh, everybody in, involved. Uh, but be that as it may, uh, the, the, the article was arguing that, that the hidden message in the speech is that this era of the expansion of U.S. and projection of military force all across the world has to be over. It has to be over, but the problem is that there's also a hidden logic in the what Eisenhower called the military-industrial complex, mm -hmm. and the contracts and the interlocking relationships between the state and corporations and government um, and the military budget is such that there's kind of a a, a, a 
almost an independent momentum mm -hmm. given to the economic drive uh, of, 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 and its force in the uh, US and world economy and politics. Mm -hmm. And that would be what, what we would expect as, as uh, in, a, in a Marxist analysis. It's not the government uh, running uh, things. It's really the ruling class, the corporate ruling class that is really in charge of what's going on. So uh, the government is kind of going along with, with what the ruling class is telling it to do. So I think, yeah, we're going to see the military industrial complex do what they want to do. They want to sell products and um, I mean, and some of it is just selling weapons on the streets of Chicago, and some of it is selling weapons to, uh, you know, countries in the global south to fight against each other. So uh, they're going to find outlets for their um, their material and um, and uh, against China as a, uh, you know, I mean, cultivating, as Rosanna said, cultivating China as an enemy uh, is probably serving that interest as well. Along with the war on terror, which fueled right-wing ideology, and and now this new offensive uh, against uh, China, which is also spawning these fascist ideas. Mm -hmm. Speaking of which, domestically, Texas, mm. Texas, the Supreme <laughs> Court in Texas, uh, no, the Supreme Court nationally upheld the Texas law banning uh, abortions after six weeks. Mm -hmm. um, oh my goodness, this has national implications. Um, Anita, it's, it's, uh, but some people aren't surprised by it, uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, I hope this is not what the future looks like in the, the United States. What do you it think? It really did take people by surprise still, even though it's not surprising considering how Trump uh, stacked the court with uh, uh, anti-women, uh, um, you know, justices. Um, and I think it's, I mean, I, I remember Chauncey Robinson had a great article in the People's World a couple of years ago that argued that um, abortion bans is a war against the working class. And that's, you know, uh, there's always, it's, they're, they're really not, <clears throat> outlawing abortion, they're outlawing legal abortion for working people. Uh, wealthy women can always get uh, um, safe abortions, but they're they're outlawing safe abortions for for most people. It's a it's a, a, a an element of class warfare against the working class. Considering that women, Rosanna, are more than half the workforce. That's right. Yeah, I think more you know. Half I think Anita is right. It's, you know, if women, some women can actually go out of state and, and get an abortion, but if you don't have the money, you know, how can you do that? So it definitely is an attack on black and brown people, especially it's, it's, women. It's now, almost, now, Michael, the Biden administration has said, has ordered all of the federal agencies to look into what they can do to circumvent this uh, Texas uh, uh, law, but they're gonna need a national uh, bill from Congress in order to override the Supreme Court's decision, I think. Well, that's the scary thing that in this period that we're entering, you know, now that the fascist danger has, you know, faced a major setback, I think we can all agree on that ever since November when Trump was, was defeated, it seems that at the local and state level, where the Republicans do have power, they're doing everything they can to kind of like dig in and get uh, whatever legislation they can get passed, um, whether it be unconstitutional or not. We see that with abortion, like in Texas, mm -hmm. we see that with um, anti-LGBT, especially anti-trans laws in places like Ohio, Georgia, Alabama. And then we also see that I think with voting rights. And so they're saying, you know, we're, if we can't rule you know, at the federal level, well, we're certainly going to rule, you know, at the, at the local level. We see that with right to work. We see that with, um, you know, the opposition against the PRO Act. All of these things, all of these issues supposedly already had legislations passed uh, protecting them, correct? Like uh, with, with the Wagner Act in the 30s, the Voting Rights Act uh, in 1965, Roe versus Wade. And so it's weird that all of these um, Supreme Court cases are now being challenged at the local and state levels by the Republicans. And we're having to pass um, more legislation to kind of like solidify those mm -hmm. legislations that were passed decades ago. 
And so it just shows you, you know, the Republicans are willing to go to really extreme lengths to overturn, you know, the uh, law in this country. It's, it's kind of frightening. And to overturn the will of the people too, yeah. because people want to have abortion rights and, and full reproductive rights for women. And people want the other good things that the Republicans want to take away, unfortunately. I think it's going to backfire. I think it's going to backfire mm -hmm. big time in the midterm elections, y'all. I think that women are going to be outraged all over the country and they're going to come out and they're going to fight this thing, you know. Um, but how many, how many people, uh, women might die between now and then before it's over, overturned and how much trouble it's going to cause in other states? We don't know. Um, speaking of states, California, Rosanna, Newsom, recall is it going to work is he going to win <laughs> well we're trying our best to make sure that people go out and vote that's the key it's going out to vote we have the votes if people just take the time to to go out and vote now everyone here in california got an absentee ballot uh so that you can vote early um that that was instituted since last the last uh, election <clears throat> because of covid <laughs> so all you have to do is really um, mark no on your ballot uh, and um, <clears throat> and send it send it along. You can even track your your ballot to make sure that it got there. <clears throat> and really, a, you know, a no vote is not just a no vote for uh, recall, but it's a no vote to the Republicans. There are <clears throat> I, I forget the. Um, there's a total of 46 candidates who are running for governor. The majority of them, the great majority of them are Republicans. So it's really also a no vote to the Republican party. And, you know, and now with this Texas ruling, it's also a no vote for, for uh, you know, um, for that law and, and for the Republicans, not just in California, but in throughout the, throughout the country. So I think, you know, just really urge everyone to just vote no. And can I I'm add probably, something? Oh, please go ahead. It seems like it's it's just another. I mean, they're they're the uh, what's going on with the right wing? What the right wing is doing is unconstitutional. I mean, I think it's unconstitutional what they what they're doing to Roe v. Wade in Texas. But it's also, I mean, it does it does it stand up to our constitution that you know Gavin Newsom could get. 49% of the vote and then and then the 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 uh somebody froze or maybe it's me. <laughs> oh, maybe it's maybe it's no, me. No, no. Yeah, you were right. You were fine, Anita. Oh, I'm fine. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean the the winner of this could be somebody with 10% of the vote. And you know, that's just not right. Yeah, it's it's just a clear attempt by the Republicans to try to take advantage of all of this. I mean, this isn't his first recall. Uh, you know, um, I think California is known as the recall happy <laughs> state, something like that. And I think, you know, there has to be some kind of limits also, but they think the Republicans believe that because it's a small election, people are not going to go out to vote. They're going to get their, their, their um, constituents to go out and vote. And, and that could do it, especially with the margins that, you know, that are set. So definitely this is why it's so important for everybody in California to vote. Everyone. So well, don't be well, not the Republicans. The last, <laughs> the, uh, last poll I saw said uh, Newsom was running ahead 58 to 43 percent, but that can make people complacent. Oh yeah. Stay yeah, home. we can't believe the we, we can't believe the polls. We just can't. We can't count on that. We have to make sure, you know. But well, good news in other parts of the country, the uh, in Virginia, Supreme Court passed a uh, ruling removing the statue of Robert E. Lee from, uh, <clears throat> so what should they do with that statue? Are they gonna put it in some corner and put a canvas over it? Are they gonna blow it use up? Use it as a trash or can. Are they gonna put it, uh, use it as a trash can? <laughs> Target practice. Uh, yeah, target they're gonna put it in the museum. Michael, what should they do with it? Freezing again. The statue of Robert E. Lee. 
Oh, Statue of Robert E. Lee. Sorry, I, I froze for a minute. Well, I think that the statues of all Confederate generals, just as I would if I was in Germany and there's statues of Hitler and, you know, they belong in a museum. I think that we don't have to um, forget our dark points in history. I think we should learn from them, but we shouldn't glorify them. You know what I mean? I, I remember when I visited the Civil Rights Museum in Birmingham, Alabama as a young person, I was terrified that they even had the, the cloak and the hood of a, of a KKK member. And I remember uh, my father explaining it, saying, this is here so that people don't forget. You know what I mean? And I remember it said anonymous donor. That's interesting. Mm. And so I think that's where they belong. You know, that it's not just that we're remembering the Civil War. We're remembering that there was a long, you know, 150, 160, almost 200 years, going on 200 years, that slavery and the history of, you know, the Confederacy were celebrated. You know, it was celebrated. It was 100 years after, it wasn't until 100 years after the Civil War ended that the Voting Rights Act was, was passed, you know, as a result of the march on in Selma. And so I think we have to remember the, the full scope of, and, and scale of the impact that slavery and racism has had on this country. So it belongs in a museum, it belongs in history books, but it definitely doesn't belong um, uh, and even in the in, in the way of names, you know, there's high schools named Robert E. Lee, mm -hmm. you know, Nathan Bedford Forrest, the founder of the Ku Klux Klan. You know, that's it's just unacceptable. Anita, put it in a museum or put a canvas over it. Well, maybe put it in a museum if it has um, some uh, educational value. Like I think, I think um, maybe uh, some of those those um, statues really had nothing to do with the Confederacy, but they had to do with the, the, the reemergence of white supremacy at various points in history. Um, and that's when the, the Confederacy starts getting celebrated by people. So, I mean, I think, I think you know, some, somewhere somebody should record what, what statue was made, when and where it was, because I like that kind of research. But, um, but I think, uh, you know, it, what's the point in seeing it? Unless maybe it's an artist who, you know, it's a particularly good, you know, example of some artist's work. Uh, I, I can't imagine that to be true, but you know, um, but that might be. But I think, yeah, just there's a lot of things in museums that, that don't get displayed and I don't see any reason to display these. Well, sign a museum, or put a canvas over it. <laughs> well, I think uh, Michael makes a good point in terms of not forgetting. So I think there has to be a way to, to do that if, those, I, I believe those statues are pretty big, so maybe do a miniature of them. Mm -hmm. And I like the idea of writing up a little history, you know, of, of what these statues, who, who did the statues, what they stood for, and, uh, but what they really stood for, you know, um, and, and giving that history, uh, promoting white supremacy and, and, and their and what they stood for and all of that, I think is, is, is important. And sometimes, you, you know, it's not always good to just read it in a book, but to actually see it, it sort of makes it much more real. I was in Germany once as a teenager and they took us to Buchenwald, the concentration camp, mm. which they turned into a museum. And um, my most vivid memory, I had two. One was a, a, a lampshade made of human skin. Mm. Mm. You think about the barbarism of these people. Yeah. Barbarians. The other was this old man who gave me, pulled me out the line and gave me this, uh, not a statue, but a plaque of Lenin, a nice big uh, silver plaque of Lenin. Mm. He, was, he said, here, young man. Mm. And uh, those are my two memories of the systematic destruction of Jewish people, people with uh, physical disabilities, gypsies, anybody who was uh, different from the so-called Aryan Ubermensch, the super, super people. <laughs> well, my ask what you're dealing with uh, on January the 6th. Yep. That mentality. Mm -hmm. That mentality. Well, that brings us to an end today. We have uh, uh, webinars coming up. 
Uh, Michael? We do. We have on the 17th, you can go to the cpusa.org, and we have a writer's workshop at 7 p.m. Eastern, uh, learning how to write letters to incarcerated people, uh, whether it be in the form of like a pen pal relationship or also writing stories to them, you know, to help free their minds since they are in such a difficult situation. And our prison abolition committee that works closely with the people's world will be leading that discussion. And then on September 19th, so that was, that's Friday. And then on the Sunday, uh, we are having a, a webinar on organizing, you know, how to organize your workplace, mm -hmm. how to organize, you know, club district, uh, you know, students, whatever, even if it's organizing everyone uh, in your neighborhood to defend some kid getting bullied. You know, it's it's important to bring people together because that's fundamental in, in building a movement for democracy and socialism. Thank you, Michael. That does it for us. You have the last word until next week. Stay safe, stay strong, and stay in the fight. Have a good week, everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye.